Good day, everyone. Good day. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. Your mental health depends on it. I am Cecilia Salazar. Glad to have you with us this week. Hi, everyone. Dean Bisundial here. We truly appreciate you connecting us with us here today. This week, we'll explore a topic that most people may not think about, but we know can lead to a more fulfilling life. Hi guys, I'm Vonad Bigford and welcome to all of you who are joining us online and to our television audience. We look forward to your feedback as per normal. Right, so Speak Your Mind is produced by Lifeline, which is Trinidad and Tobago's 24-hour support line that listens to the despairing and suicidal. Speak Your Mind creates a space for regular discussions on mental health issues here in the Caribbean. So we can start removing the stigmas associated with it and help you find some valuable solutions and develop better mental health patterns. In today's show, we're looking into why it is important for you to be on the path of finding your identity. Mm -hmm. So some people can make it through make it very far in life without giving their identity too much thought. So you might wonder, does a strong sense of identity really make a difference? Hmm. Because lacking a clearly defined identity often makes it tough to know exactly what you want. If you feel uncertain or indecisive when it comes time to make important choices, you may end up struggling to make any choice at all. As a result, you might simply drift through life carried by other people and circumstances rather than your own momentum. This often leads to discontent, even when nothing specific seems wrong and you can't identify the source of your unhappiness. Or perhaps you've noticed that you have a pattern of making choices based on what you think other people want from you. Or maybe you don't have many ambitions or deep-seated passions and simply feel content to go with the flow. That is where finding your identity can help. So to help us navigate this discussion today, we have retired psychiatrist Agri Burke joining us live from London. He's an academic who spent the majority of his medical career at St. George's Hospital in London, UK, specializing in transcultural psychiatry and writing literature on changing attitudes towards Black people and their mental health. And we're happy to have also Professor Gerald Hutchinson, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of the West Indies and we also have Dr. Ram Prasad Paris Ram, a psychiatrist, politician, cricketer, pundit, and former chairman at the NCRHA, North Central Regional Health Authority. A packed show with a powerful panel. So let's connect with our guests now and start the conversation. Thank you. 
Okay, first, welcome our guests live from the United Kingdom. Welcome, Dr. Burke. So glad you have joined us today. Thanks a lot. Yes, you know, the um, I, I sometimes, I started psychiatry in Trinidad, and then when I got back to Jamaica, they say, but boy, you changed. <laughs> so, you know, even within a small setting, there are these differences in identity. But today, there is a challenge we have of um, making sense of the client or patient who feels messed up, who feels that their self-esteem has gone, who feels that they don't know what their life is about. And that sense of identity, confusion, you could say, identity, um, loss is a great problem that psychiatry and the general public faces every day. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, we have, oh, we also have Dr. Paris Ram with us. Welcome, Dr. Paris Ram. It's truly an honor to have you with us again. And of course, to my pal, Dr. Professor Gerard Hutchinson, <laughs> great to have you both with us today. And to those who have joined us live online, please share our show on your timeline. And we look forward to your comments and questions to our expert panel. Mm -hmm. So, gentlemen, I know that identity and self-worth is not something that many people consider, but I feel it is at the core of finding your true happiness. We have heard that defining yourself mostly by relationships with others or your ability to please your loved ones can suggest a less developed sense of self or, or identity. Is that true? Well, I mean, I think identity is such a complex and layered thing. And as um, Dr. Burke just said, I mean, just within relatively small communities, your identity can shift based on your experiences. Mm -hmm. And that identity is always measured against the identity of the group that you I identify with and right. that identifies with you. So identity contributes to your sense of membership of a wider group. And from that, I think you draw some of your self-esteem and some of your self-worth, that sense of belonging. So I think identity is also tied to belonging. If we, had, if we had to give a definition for identity, what would that definition be? I do not want to really tie myself into any compartment and, and say <laughs> this is going as X, Y, or Z, yeah, right. quite honestly. Yeah. But I think it's fundamental that we ask ourselves, who am I? Mm -hmm. What are my core beliefs? Where am I in this, in this scheme of things? And what are my aspirations, where it is that I want to go. Um, and having asked myself these questions, I think these things would constitute my identity. But um, Professor Hutchison is talking about um, the group we identify with, which also, in a sense, um, is very, very important. And it has to do then with, um, do I have a sense of belonging to a particular group? I said earlier in, the, in another program that I am a proponent of the concept that the world is one family, but notwithstanding, we are not a homogeneous group, we are a heterogeneous group, and we tend as human beings to um, belong or see ourselves as belonging to certain groups. And, and I would also like therefore to look at um, the kinds of affiliation that uh, I would want to have in the society. Um, so it would and actually, it then strengthens me to know that I belong to a group of people and that I have shared values and those kinds of things. So, so that's how I would like to view the subject. And I, of course, when I do not have answers to any of the things I have proposed, I think that's when I begin to get into trouble. And um, that's when things like identity crises and other things begin to kick in. So I, I would say I would want to start by knowing who I am, and that would be my definition of identity for me, and also about my basic philosophy and affiliations in those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think denial of self and, and identity starts somewhat in our childhood. Like, um, for example, like you're trying to, to express yourself a particular way and you're being criticized or you're being punished for that form of self-expression. And you might respond by then trying to change what your natural response would have been um, to be a little more accepted more, more than anything else. So let's look at a clip that explains that somewhat. Without knowing who we are, we tend to have particular trouble coping with either denigration or adulation. If other people decide that we are worthless or bad, there will be nothing inside us to prevent us from swallowing their verdicts in their entirety, however wrong-headed, mm -hmm. extreme or unkind these might be. We'll be helpless before the court of public opinion. We'll always be asking other people what we deserve before seeking inside for an answer. Lacking an independent verdict, we also stand to be unnaturally hungry for external praise. The clapping of an audience will matter to us far more than would ever be wise. We'll be prey to rushing towards whatever idea or activity the crowd happens to love. We'll laugh at jokes that aren't funny, uncritically accept undeserving concepts that are in vogue, and neglect our truer talents for easy, popular wins. We'll trail public opinion slavishly, constantly checking the world's whims rather than consulting an inner barometer in order to know what we should want, feel and value. We need to be kind on ourselves. No one is born with an independent ability to know who they are. We learn to have an identity because, if we're blessed, in our early years, someone else takes the trouble to study us with immense fairness, attention and kindness and then plays us back to us in a way that makes sense and that we can later emulate. They give us the beginning of a true portrait of our identity, which we can then take on and enrich over the years and use as a defence against the distorting verdicts from hurried or ill-intentioned others. Knowing who one is is really the legacy of having been known properly by somebody else at the start. Oh. Mm. Dr. Bill, what are your thoughts on that video? <laughs> well, that's a difficult um, way of looking at it, I think. Um, here in Britain, we, and, and there are probably about near, nearly 2 million Caribbean people and probably about the same number of so-called mixed race, which would be a mixture of Caribbean mainly and English European. Um, and the population does not see, does not perceive the rates of richness, or the rates of professionalism, the rates of um, um, capacity to defend ourselves as constant in all ethnic groups. So some ethnic groups are rich mm -hmm. and some ethnic groups are not rich. Some ethnic groups, um, Caribbean just win some cricket. <laughs> um, but, you know, to just win cricket is probably not enough in the modern world. There are other attributes which go along with the group being seen as capable and worthwhile. And when we move from the group to the individual, we have other issues to deal with. And in Britain, one would say that the easiest way of identifying a group that have problems of identity would be the total group. But in the clinical model, it becomes an issue of who is seeking help or need to seek help because of their problems of identity. Hmm. And it's probably one in, I would think, one in 30 or so of society would seek help for problems of identity. So it's rather different from the totality of the population that may have difficulties negotiating to that population who have the difficulties are so great 
that they have to seek help. Mm. And that poses an issue, a problem of separating out one group from the other. But it also poses a problem of delivery. Can a person from India go to a person from Europe and feel secure? Or a person from the Caribbean going to a person from India, in India, and feel secure? The Nigerian population is now much more evident here. Is the nature of the interaction an easy one for the Caribbean person? So those are issues which we have to consider in talking about identity. Mm. The frequency, the severity, the delivery, and how much it upsets or prevents one from living a normal life. That's right. the huge issue about identity. It huh. prevents normal living to so that, you know, probably two, three percent who are really in bad shape because of identity-related issues. Yes, yeah. well, a couple of things, yes. If you separate the group from the individual and the individual in crisis, identity crisis, coming into a room for therapy, for counseling, one of the, the, the things about, uh, did I hear the word normal being used? What constitutes normal behavior? <laughs> and also whether one, person belonging to one ethnic group or one social group would be comfortable being counseled um, or directed by a person from another group? Mm -hmm. These are, are very basic questions that we need to answer. Mm -hmm. If I do not have an understanding as a therapist of the individual's group and what they consider norms or normative behavior, then I will be at a disadvantage. And also, you know, there's also the issue about if I am going to pontificate and say, well, listen, what you have done here is wrong, by whose standard? And these things really are very, very important in multicultural societies, multi-ethnic okay. societies. Um, and nowadays, of course, in the new world, there are hardly any homogeneous societies. And um, so, is, you know, there was a time, perhaps my colleagues in psychiatry would recall, where they would say that if a therapist comes from an upper middle class background mm -hmm. and he had to counsel an inner city person, mm -hmm. a black inner city person, would he be the right therapist for that individual? I think, Dr. Burke, you were going on that road, yes? Mm -hmm. So um, I think even in getting therapy, or going to a therapist, choosing a therapist and getting therapy, you have to get one who has a full understanding of the background and the linkages and associations of the person he or she is dealing with. Interesting. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I think um, one of the, the things that influences that is the question of acceptability or what is deemed acceptable in terms of behavior in terms of the things that one identifies with mm -hmm. and we have to deal with the reality that a lot of our references have come from britain in terms of colonization and the whole colonial experience and mm -hmm. even the post-colonial world those references, some of those references remain and remain quite strong. Some might argue that these days, perhaps those references come from the States, from the, from the North American perspective. Mm -hmm. And we kind of define acceptability in those terms. And therefore, sure. are that is that valid? And are those norms that they are um, yeah. learning, do they apply and can they apply to us? Oh, yeah. I think, and I think is... with regard to the therapy issue, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking as both um, Dr. Burke and Dr. Parsham were talking, I was thinking, you know, if if somebody had, I don't know, appendicitis and they needed a surgeon, would it matter whether that surgeon was a different ethnicity or came from a different culture? Or, I think all they would want to know is that person was competent. Mm -hmm. But in mental health, it's not just about competence, it's about that ability to identify 
with, with the person, with the person and their perspectives and their, yeah. um, you know, okay. how they see the world. Yeah, well, you made, just want to say you made a very good point there when you talk about London and you talked about America, because a lot of young people, if your identity comes from um, watching American television or, or that's the only influence you have. So that's where sometimes media or art, theatre, seeing yourself a lot more. And I think that's a, a, a problem in Trinidad where we, we don't, the young people need to get that identity. What is their identity in Trinidad, their music, their culture, not bringing it, importing it from other countries all the time. I think that's very important. So interesting yeah. that you brought up um, music, Cecilia, because in our country today, we have a lot of violence and crime. And one of the most trending songs, well, not on the radio, but on YouTube, is called Wap Wap. Wap, wap. It's about the, so the sound your gun makes when you kill someone. Oh boy. This video has over 2.5 million views in just two weeks. Wow. It has young gun-toting angry men in poor communities celebrating killing their foes. The sad thing is that this song is resonating in our youth at every level. This identity and way of, li of life of celebrating killing each other is worrying. My concern is what happens to the young, impressionable 12-year-old who's searching for self, for identity, and this disregard for life is being celebrated by the people he's around and look up to. Um, is it that we are just becoming the older generation that looks down on the youths thinking, you know, that they're worthless, or is it that um, there's some sort of media influence that, um, that shapes... Uh, uh, this this sort of um, identity. Um, I, I, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this. Well, well permit me uh, that I mentioned the word marketing before, yes. what we are taught and how we are taught. Now we live in a global village with, uh, with a revolution, really, in communication. Then um, that's putting it mildly. People walk around with um, smartphones and, and um, they're learning from the World Wide Web all the time and they're learning from movies and, and serials all over the world. And uh, so, by the way, if that child, that impressionable child, is not well rooted in his or her, her own ethnic group, mm -hmm. that child is going to be influenced by other groups. This is what we used to call in the old days, good old days, as peer group pressure, and you, you, you're asked to do something that is not the norm within your own family group, but, but right. you do it nonetheless. It's an extension of that, but in a way that could be very damaging. I think it is fair to remember good old Bandura, a sociologist, if I remember well, who spoke about the influence of media. Um, Dean, I hope I'm correct. Uh, this is 1966 research. Yes, it's old. <laughs> but it spoke about how television influenced impressionable minds. Right. And now what is happening to this generation is something that must prove a challenge to researchers, quite frankly. But... Um, I am of the view that um, there needs to be proper mentoring and parental guidance for, for this young group. And also that option on your, uh, your cable provider that says parental control yeah, um, is required. Yes. Because I also have a sense that sometimes parents uh, abdicate their responsibilities towards helping their children. Um, look at the right programming and then have the ability to discuss that with them. So this discussion has been taking place for a very, very long time. Now, don't forget, though, that our generation, and I'm correct in saying, Agribook, I wouldn't ask you age or Professor Hutchison or <laughs> the rest of you. But look, I am going, I'm in, I passed 75 in close to 78. And I also recall the age of the flower children of Vietnam, of mm -hmm. the sexual revolutions of the 70s and various other things, mm -hmm. how marketing forces influence generations. And I, I think that's a reality of the world in which we have lived and continue to live. We have mm -hmm. to find innovative, creative ways of having a solid grounding, if I may, for yeah. our young people. Mm -hmm. 
definitely. Thank you. I think that's very, um, very apt what you've said. And yet there is this real problem of um, how, what process is there in society to allow a newborn child, a, a growing child, an adolescent, to have a set of values and uh, attitudes and opinions that she or she can maintain in a consistent manner and see that as a representation of themselves, his, himself or herself. And I think if through this, by virtue of a family life, schooling, and societal values, we can achieve that among, let's say, 70% of the population, we're doing pretty well. And we're really talking about that 30% perhaps. Could be 20, could be 25, could be 30, that don't maintain that set of values in a consistent way and sometimes come for help. Sometimes they don't come for help. They just drink some more rum, <laughs> take some more ganja. Exactly. Break up a family life, marriage finished, mm -hmm. hit each other, domestic violence, mm -hmm. or become involved in other forms of um, self-deception, you could call it, but for them it isn't self-deception. It's an outcome of them, how they feel about themselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's the group that we have to battle with because that 30% will not go down very easily unless something is available for them and that they can make sense of. And I say 30%, I might be wrong, it could be 20, it could be even 15. Mm -hmm. But it varies and it's a vulnerable group that is at risk of, lo of um, losing its self-esteem, its self-worth, and its place in society. I think that's the group we have to yeah. maintain a close eye on yeah. and provide services to. Yeah, society is responsible. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I agree with, with, with both those statements. Um, and it's a kind of chicken and egg thing because yeah. there's no doubt. I mean, if you look at murder rates, for example, that the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Bahamas um, have quite high murder rates. And when you look at who is being murdered and who is doing the the um, the murdering, the you know, it 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 does speak to as um, Dr. Burke was saying. Uh, a fairly small group in the society, but a group that makes a lot of noise and therefore gets noticed. And then how does that in creating an environment where that is glorified or that is celebrated, can you then stop generations from following it? And I know even in, in certainly in London, I don't know about the other cities, there's been an upsurge in knife crime in the inner cities. And again, they've been talking about this increased violence in 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 those um areas so i think the question is how do we reach those people can we reach them right and how do we i mean how is that how how is all of that related to mental health and how mm. can we prevent the the continuing um destruction of young people yeah in 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 those inner cities yeah, I think the, the leaders of a country, leaders, religious leaders, political leaders, community leaders, have a responsibility to shape the identity of the country. And that will trickle down, you know, in, in Shakespeare, where they say, you know, something is rotten at the, in the state of Denmark. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> but let's go on to another, another side of it here. Um, most some people want to be accepted and they take on multiple personalities just to fit it. So is this changeable self of self 
served you well during your teen years. This lesson can remain with you well into adulthood. So you might take on, for example, a certain persona at work, another when you're with your family, and still another when you spend time with your friends. Is this switching between different selves? Does it make it difficult to find your true identity and create a less stressful life? Which multiple identities we all have. Well, you see, look, it goes back to how we are rooted, right? Look at the young person entering a workplace. Let's say a person coming from a rural background, from a simple uh, middle-class family, goes to work in a high-powered conglomerate place uh, where the, the culture itself, the culture in, in that office or that office building is different from what the person is accustomed to and then you find all kinds of issues cropping up you know people see these these conversations and it's ridiculous when you talk about wanting to change your your hairstyle the food you eat the clothes you wear the you because um, you want to be accepted in, in 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 that group in that new group as an equal you would perhaps want to do better than some of your peers in that group but you have a superficial sense of self that, mm. you know, how you look in the mirror is all that there is to it. And then that you could just get by with that. Mm. Comes back to people having to understand that what will eventually get you by is a consistent set of values. Yeah, you did mention the role of religion to religion also has a role because in pro-social behavior, um, religion has a role in guiding people as to what kinds of values would serve them well in every circumstance. And, and I think, you know, we cannot just take these things lightly. Uh, I could tell you 101 anecdotes of people, either from psychiatry or from politics or from religion, that I have met um, who have constant issues with themselves, this feeling of low self-esteem, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I, I'm not properly dressed, and so on. Mm -hmm. So we really have to go to those institutions um, that deal with the 70%, and now as far as the 30% is concerned, that pathological group, as some people would say, because they kind of drop out of mainstream or engage in crimes, or the pathological tale of our famous bell curve, what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. I think I want to go back to something that Professor Hutchinson was saying earlier. We don't want a simply imported model, but we don't want to also reinvent the wheel. We have to really have a group of highly skilled professionals looking at the available evidence and uh, matching it with the demands of our reality and coming up with a practical way of dealing with it. Well said. I think there is an issue here here, however, and the issue is about the island people. Yeah. Caribbean is made up of island people except for Guiana, but Guiana doesn't have very close relationship with Brazil nor with Venezuela, not very close. Um, so we are island people in terms of language, in terms of we are surrounded by Spanish speaking countries. We, the motherland was some thousands of miles away. <laughs> and it, it, it's ceasing to be motherland anymore, really. It's going down in that estimation. And we are prone to express our sense of unrest, let's call it unrest, by migrating. Mm. So migration yes. sometimes is an outcome of emotional turmoil, identity issues. And on migration, there are huge, huge number of other problems that arise. One could be find oneself, um, Professor Hutchinson mentioned, impulsive behaviors, knife crime. One could find oneself losing one step at school. One could find oneself becoming displaced in a relationship. One could find oneself even deported. So there are a number of alternative routes that the state can take, and the individual is not that free to be free and it is that individual who has a problem getting a clear sense of his beliefs his attitudes his behavior how he perceives the world these are vulnerable individuals 
Mm-hmm. And at the extreme, such individuals come for help and present with emotional instability and instability in relationships. Mm-hmm. And therein, we have this issue of identity coming out in a much more florid way. Yeah. And uh, for that very small group, they need help. Yeah, just uh, so uh, you, you touched on it exactly because my next point was about um, sense of self and identity as it, as it relates to functional relationships. And, and what, what do you think is the relationship between having a good sense of self and having positive, successful, well-balanced relationships? Professor Hutchinson, you want to jump in there? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I guess it's it's what is the definition of a functional and <laughs> relationship? Because I think I think that's changing too, um, with the changes in in economic um, behavior. Um, where when I grew up, women working was not a very common thing. Now it is the norm. Um, mothers and Fathers both out of the house, supervision of the children, all those issues, I think, you know, kind of influence um, how productive and functional a relationship is. We have now instances where women are doing better than men in terms of, you know, the woman is working for more money than the man, and there's an impact of that on the relationship. So I think all those things also influence the sense of self. So I think it's a it's a two-way thing. The, the sense of self informs the relationship, but the relationship also informs the sense of self. All right. And I think we also have to consider the influence of, you know, social media and the internet and how we expose to behavior from people all over the world and how we measure up against that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and what that does to our sense of self. Yeah, keeping up with the Kardashians kind of thing. Anyway, (laughs) Judge Helen Whitner is a Trinidadian American attorney and uh, and jurist serving as an associate justice of the Washington Supreme Court. She presented at a TED Talk in Port of Spain, Trinidad in 2015. Here is what she had to say about identity. One of the most precious commodities we have is our identity. By that I mean the way we see ourselves and the way we assess our self-worth. At a young age, I discovered that society had predetermined codes that were used not just to identify us, but were used to determine who we are and who we were going to be. These codes were arbitrary, and limited one's potential. I decided that I was not going to be molded by, limited by, or controlled by these codes or identifiers. My parents were teachers, and one very important lesson they taught me is the importance of respect, having self-respect, and then you can respect others. My father always said, to thine own self be true. Hmm. At this time, I want to welcome those of us joining us online. We appreciate having you here today with us. Um, Let's see what some of your thoughts and comments are, shall we? So Ricardo says, identity looks at who Am I? Once identity is developed from socialization, the family, school, church, and in today's society, definitely with media. Ricci Borelli uh, says, I think identity can be described as a pattern of thoughts, behaviors, and beliefs to which one individual may adhere. Uh, it can also include an assimilation of external thoughts from adults, peers, and media that in turn could be internalized. And our good friend Swain Leo, Swain Kedogan, hi Swain. Um, the DSM, DSMIB cultural formulation interview actually highlighted how important a role cultural identities play in our understanding and acceptance of mental health issues and treatment. 
And another good friend of ours, Lucretia Gabriel. Hello, Lucy. Uh, vigorous discussions of issues, particularly the ideas of underlying a lot of popular music, videos, etc. To some, such discussion kills the mindless aspect of the material. Just imbibe it and don't realize that this will affect their behavior mm -hmm. all right thank you guys for your comments thanks so much for the comments guys keep them coming um and let's move on to see um some of the ways in which we can deal with it because <laughs> So realizing that you lack okay. a stable identity can be very life-changing. But how do you really deal with it? Before we get to our experts, let's look at this video clip. Realizing that we lack a stable identity is a sobering realization. But we can, with a fair wind, start to correct the problem at any point. We need to seek out the help of a wise and kindly other person. Perhaps a good psychotherapist, someone who can study us closely, mirror us properly, and then validate what they see. Through their eyes, we can learn to study, perhaps for the first time, how we really feel, and take seriously what we actually want. We can, by being witnessed generously, more often learn to take our own sides, and feel increasingly solid inside, trusting ourselves more than we trust the crowd feeling that we might be able to say no, not always swaying in the wind and feeling that we are in possession of some of the ultimate important truths about us. Having come to know ourselves like this, we will be a little less hungry for praise, a little less worried by opposition and a lot more original in our thinking. We will have learned the vital art of both knowing and befriending who we really are. Wow. So gentlemen, what are some of the ways that we could start addressing this idea of trying to help people develop, I mean, figure out what their identity is or, or, or develop the sense of self? If we want to start with Dr. Dr. Okay. What are yeah. some of the <laughs> any suggestions? I think if I could um, consider the issues which we are faced with here abroad, um, they may be a bit different from those approaches that one may adopt if one is at home. Mm -hmm. Because at home, often there is a family, there's a set of friends, there is a workmate situation. Abroad, one is probably exposed to insecurity far more than one would if one remained at home. But you know, this question of identity doesn't simply come out of the blue. The majority of people with identity, identity challenges, let's call them challenges, mm -hmm. have had quite difficult upbringings as well. And so there is that background of um, grooming, you could say, in living in difficult times, um, sometimes inconsistent times, sometimes abusive. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're somewhere like in England or America or Canada, rejection at the workplace or in society may be far more common than it would be at home. Mm -hmm. So some of the issues are generalized issues. Some of them are very personal. If one has a challenge to do with oneself, one's incapacity, one's self-esteem, one's self-worth, then it may make sense to go to a, um, a therapist or sometimes a minister at the church can help. Sometimes a good friend can help. But sometimes it overboils boils over and one needs to seek help mm -hmm. from someone who adopts a different approach, talks regularly, does some counseling and brings one out of the depths of despair. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one might even need to be treated with medication. Mm -hmm. Sometimes one may be treated with psychological 
um, therapies. So there are a number of approaches to varying conditions. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the you know, therapies is, it's, it's interesting that the video focused on therapy as, as the, the major method. Um, there was a psychologist in England, I think, a guy called Oliver James, who said that they should abandon A levels or CAPE and send everybody <laughs> to psychotherapy for those two years um, rather sure. than in school. Um, but I think the, it, it really comes down, as the video is saying, and as, as um, Dr. Booth is saying, to that capacity to understand yourself, to be aware of the things that influence you and your behavior. So it means a constant interrogation of, of who you are mm -hmm. and as a, a, a means of accepting what you see mm -hmm. and having the, the courage and the willingness to change the things or try to change the things that are um, problematic, even if it means going to therapy, like we said, um, when you realize that maybe you can't change them on your own. But I think the, the, the real thing is to be constantly interrogating it, constantly asking yourself, who am I? What am I doing? Am I reaching the, um, the goals that I've set for myself? Why I'm not reaching them if I'm not? Or how can I do better? How can I engage myself better in terms of my ability to engage with the world? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the, 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 the base of any method that would be used to address the issue. Well, I agree with my colleagues and uh, there are other issues to consider. Though. A person who is shattered, low self-esteem, in crisis, identity crisis, who doesn't feel good about himself, is very often not well motivated and sometimes can become irrational as Dr. Walton said, requiring therapy from a trained therapist. So, what that tells me is because the individual is so shattered sometimes, so he or she may not be able to pick up himself, um, think rationally, and seek help. Right. One needs support systems around mm -hmm. the individual. In foreign conditions, sometimes it's difficult to have that support system. I myself have lived on three continents. I, I have some understanding of how it feels. But the fact is that they, we also need to have caring environments, supportive environments, where people, significant others in the life of such individuals, recognize they have issues and try to get them into therapy. I think that's very, very important. Yes. But as the old adage, I just want to throw this in the mix too, about prevention being better than cure too, it's to look for that consistent set of values that I was speaking about earlier. At at home and at school uh, where such support systems are available and um, make sure the individual has a good sense of self. That's your best preventative tool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think it's all about who do you see yourself as and what you bring to the table and not just living your life trying to make someone else happy, but finding your own true happiness. Only then I will feel you can give you can give to others we have this video clip from therapist georgia dow let's take a listen we are often not who we think we are if you have been told your entire life that you are stupid or worthless or not good enough you might believe that even though it is completely untrue and so that can lead to anxiety regret depression, apprehension, you choosing people that are not good enough for who you are as a person, or it'll even change your entire job schema. Because you might say to yourself, you know what, I'm not going to be able to do this, or I'm not strong enough, or I'm not smart enough to be able to handle this. It is vastly important to your own self-esteem, directly related to your own self-esteem, is who do you see yourself as? Hmm. That was great. Hmm. So much to learn. Now let's explore how do we go about finding help. Hmm. All right. 
So this is a big question. Where can someone find help to lead them to find themselves? Or is this a very personal journey? Hmm, that's, that, is, that is a very heavy question. Um, I think, I think as Dr. Parsha, I'm not saying the prevention yeah. aspect of it. I think if you, if you're strongly rooted in your family and your community, then that's, that's where it begins. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it, it kind of goes outward from there to the friendships you develop, to the other communities that you join, your work community, if you, you know, go to university or whatever, your, the communities, your sport, if you play a sport. So I think within those communities, once they're supportive, that would be the place. I think if there are problems and you need to go outside of that, then I think um, you, the, the, the mental health services or the religious service, religious group that you might belong to might be the, the, the next um, the next place. And um, but I think it, 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 it still will revolve around your commitment to finding yourself or to wanting to find yourself. Yeah. And I think that the generating of that commitment is the is, is a critical thing. Well, yeah, I was a little disadvantaged with the sound of the rain in the background. <laughs> That's what it is, the rain. But uh, uh, the, the fact of the matter is um, the subject itself challenges us in a variety of ways. Huh? Um, where to get help? I think that's what we're talking about. And how do you get that help? Yeah. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, let us uh, make a plug here for Lifeline because I think that's one place you can call if you're not feeling good about yourself. But I want to lament the fact that I, I don't think that we have sufficient support systems mm -hmm. um, that are easily accessible. And it really speaks to the state of development of uh, mental health care in third world countries. And I suppose in Britain too, because there are groups that may not be able to access the level of care that they need, even in the so-called developed countries, if they come from disadvantaged communities. Yes. So uh, that's, that's the truth of the fact. For example, if we were talking about school counselors, we have to ask the question, how many school counselors do we have? What is the population requiring help? And what would be the therapist to uh, client ratio? But not only that, we also have to look at affordability, affordability of care outside of the public health care system, which is fortunately free in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, can the person in need sometimes who is dropped out, who is not feeling good about himself, who doesn't have dollars and cents, really get the kind of care? So I want to make a plug for pastoral counseling, counseling offered by non-psychiatrists, non-psychologists, um, elders in the community. I, I want to challenge um, Dr. Burke to go back in time to a, to a fellow called Professor Nakey, who wrote a, a, a paper called Guru Chela Relationship, a Paradigm for Therapy. Um, Professor Hutchinson, I, I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, but I think you must have read it. It was mm -hmm. a landmark that tells us there are significant people in the lives of individuals, like gurus in this instance, who may be able to provide guidance and counseling. We need to explore that. Yes, I think that is so true. Well, um, thank you for um, reminding me of that important paper. But looking at how we are perceived um, and what happens to the vulnerable when they um, fall over, because of identity issues associated quite often with abuse of drugs, abuse in terms of violent behavior towards loved ones, sometimes towards children. Mm -hmm. um, the large number of people in prison will be having problems of identity. Mm -hmm. And then there is this issue of the population that presents with psychosis, oh. severe mental illness, and will be wrongly diagnosed as being schizophrenic or mood disorder, and have a primary disorder of emotional instability 
which we call borderline personality disorder. Now, the only way that one can really help people with such clients with such severe conditions is to go to a professional who is skilled in dealing with that. Mm -hmm. And so there is this question as to whether society is prepared to make a go of it and to provide sufficient therapies to help this population of people yes. when they need help. Definitely. Well, guys, that, that leads us to our next segment, our final segment, Where is the Hope? We know one place you can turn to when you're feeling overwhelmed. You can reach out to our friends at Lifeline. Let's take a look at this. Guys, it was wonderful having you all, um, Dr. Parasram. Well, it's a pleasure being on this program, and um, I enjoyed the session very much. And I think the subject is very, very important, and it really needs further exploration. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Yes. Yes, I'll endorse those words. It is indeed a pleasure, especially to talk with my esteemed colleagues um, and to learn from them in terms of you know their, their insights coming from their, their wide experience and I think these kinds of programs are important for the wider community in terms of addressing issues that need discussion and exploration but perhaps are not discussed sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great honor to have been asked to be part of this program. And um, I guess if one had to identify uh, a sector that might have been as productive as, productive as we have been, I'm suggesting we have been productive, <laughs> it, would be, it would be the psychologists and the counselors there are quite a number of very good people there in Trinidad, actually, mm -hmm. more than we have here. Yeah, and that's good news. And we've Gosh. got to we've got to push for more, still more, yeah. because we are very vulnerable people, mm -hmm. and uh, we won't do it on our own when the going is rough. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was indeed our pleasure having you all here with us today. It was enlightening as usual, looking at identity of self, identity as a nation, identity as Caribbean people, ethnic identity. There's so much still to delve into. And and we it's each of our responsibilities to help and share each other on the journey. Thank you so much for your time and thoughts. Yes, and I would like to thank, thank as usual, those of us joining us online and who took part in today's show. Join us next time. Same time, same place. I'm Dean Bisundial. Have a great week, everyone. Guys, one at Bigfoot here. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Take care. Yes, I'm Cecilia Salazar. And as we always yes. say at OMG, let's, let's be kind to each other. Each other. <laughs> so, Bye. Nice Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So if you, my fellow citizens, truly believe 
that here every creed and race can find an equal place. Stand up with me for equality in all its forms for all. For all. We, have we have differences, but we are not truly are different. Not. We have the ability and the power to crack these predetermined codes and we can claim our identities and chart the course of our destinies and we can do it standing side by side. Thank you.